أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I start in the name of Allah the beneficent and the merciful I seek salvation from shaitan the accursed Dear viewers Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace, blessings and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you all at all times I would like to welcome you to another show of the Ramadan show on this very special night, we are getting prepared for the nights of Al-Qadr and apart from that, we are also getting ready for the nights of the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Before proceeding on to the show, I just want to remind you once again that you can join us on social media using Twitter and using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. You can join us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Please also don't forget to send us your videos from wherever you are to show the rest of the world how you prepare for the month of Ramadan. Before proceeding on to the show, I just wanted to remember one hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen. And it seems like there's no better night to remember it and no better occasion to remember it than this. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Tears dry up due to the harshness or the hardness of the heart and hardness of the heart is caused due to frequent sinning in this month and in these great nights let's endeavor to try and seek forgiveness for our sins and therefore soften our hearts which will allow us to cry and repent towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more and therefore elevate our spiritual status In this episode, when we talk about spiritual refinement, we'll be taking an example from that individual, that personality who was thought to be the peak of piety. That individual who was not only the peak of piety but known as the peak of eloquence. We'll be talking about Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The reason why we will be concentrating on this individual, this personality, is because over the coming nights we'll be commemorating his martyrdom. But before I go into his martyrdom, I just want to talk a little bit about who he was as a person. What guidance he gave us and what did he show us through his day-to-day -day life. Books of tradition and books of history have told us that Amir al-Mu'mineen was thought to be the perfect human being and the realization of all the possible, all the good possible ethical traits and moral traits of a human being. And he stayed away from all vices all the negative traits that can possibly exist in a human being. He was thought to be one of the best worshippers of his time. His worship was not only excellent in the form of quantity, amount of time, but also in quality because he prayed with full sincerity, presence of heart and the observation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of his famous sayings was, O oh Allah, I do not worship you for the fear of punishment or for the hope of reward. I worship you solely because I know that you are worthy of worship. Someone once asked Amir al-Mu'mineen, Have you seen your Lord so that you worship him? He replied, Woe be unto you. I do not worship the Lord who I have not seen. Then he was asked, How have you seen him? Amir al-Mu'mineen said, A human eye cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather his heart can perceive Allah by real belief. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant to Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is how he, in his mind, in his soul, became close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about his piety, 
Piety in the essence of the word means no interest in worldly issues, no interest in property, no, no interest in money, positions or status. Amir al-Mu'mineen by that definition was one of the most pious men that has ever existed. Imam al-Sadiq has said, Amir al-Mu'mineen was the most similar person to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, in the way he ate. He ate bread, vinegar and olives, whilst he fed the people bread and meat. Once it is said that food was brought in the presence of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and that food was made with dates, raisins and oil. At that time it was thought to be a very lavish meal. Amir al-Mu'mineen refused to eat that. He was asked, do you know that this kind of food, do you think that this kind of food is unlawful? Amir al-Mu'mineen said, no, it is not unlawful, but I fear that if I eat it, I may like it and get used to it. And then he recites the following verse. He says, and on the day that the unbelievers will be placed before the fire, it will be said to them, Ye received your good things in the life of the world. Amir al-Mu'mineen always focused and paid specific attention to the hereafter. In whatever he did, in the way he conducted himself, he never forgot his Lord in every moment through his life. Having talked a little bit about who Amir al-Mu'mineen was in terms of his piety, in terms of his worship. I now bring our minds towards the 21st of the holy month of Ramadan. It is the date of the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was the victim of being struck on the head by the sword of Ibn Muljim. May the curse of Allah be upon him in the mosque of Kufa on the night of the 19th of the holy month of Ramadan. Ibn Muljim had been lying in wait for Amir, Amir al-Mu'mineen from the beginning of the night. And when Amir al-Mu'mineen walked past, his assassin was pretending to be asleep amidst a group of other people. Some narrations say that suddenly he sprang out and struck Amir al-Mu'mineen on top of the head with the sword which was poisoned and the Imam was in a very poor state for three days as the poison travelled through his body. He left behind some of the guides that we look at in our daily lives today. He left behind his children, those reflections of him who until today stand tall in the world as we remember what they've done for us. He left behind Imam, Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Sayyidah Zainab, Lady Umm Kulthum, and Abu Fadl al Abbas. Salam. These are the reflections of what Amir al Mu'mineen was, all of his positive traits. After he passed away, his two eldest sons, Imam Hassan and Imam al Hussein, salam, gave him ghusl, washed him, and shrouded him. They carried him to Al Ghari in Najaf, where they eventually buried him. We've already talked a little bit about Imam Ali alayhi salam, the way he would worship, his piety, the height of his love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we move on towards his martyrdom. The reason why we're focusing on this great personality on these nights is that Amir al Mu'mineen was martyred or he died on the 21st of the holy month of Ramadan. When we look at his life, even in his death, we see how much trials Amir al-Mu'mineen faced. We saw how much hatred the people had, had for him because of his truthfulness, because of his path in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the night of the 19th of Ramadan, Ibn Muljim, may Allah's curse be upon him, was lying in wait for Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was pretending to be asleep. And when Amir al-Mu'mineen walked by a group of people, 
Ibn Muljim was within this group of people and he was pretending to be fast asleep. Amir al-Mu'mineen then proceeded towards Masjid al-Kufa, the place where he was eventually struck. He began his prayers and as he began his prayers, Ibn Muljim, he sprang out from the crowd of people with his sword which was poisoned and as Amir al-Mu'mineen went into sujood, he struck the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen. At this point, Amir al-Mu'mineen was brought back to his home where his young children, those children whom we look to today, the reflections of his beautiful being, the reflection of his piety. He left behind children who, are, who stand today as the height of standing for the truth, as the height of truthfulness. And they're the individuals who are also one of our guides. He left behind Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Lady Zainab, Lady Umm Kulthum, and Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. When he was brought back, his children tended to him. But as the body, as the, as the poison began to seep through the body of Amir Mu'mineen, he lay in a bad state for three days and eventually met with his martyrdom on the 21st of the holy month of Ramadan. Soon after he died, his two eldest sons, Imam Hassan and Hussein alayhi salam, they washed him and they gave him ghusl. They shrouded his body and took him to a place within the confines of Najaf where they buried him. It is said that after the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the little orphans in the streets of Najaf were wondering what had happened to, their, to the person who would give them food, to the person who would look after them. Amir al-Mu'mineen was well known to go out during the night with a, with a veil so that people would not see who he was. And with the veil on, he would give food to the orphans. He would show them love and affection, something that they were lacking because they had no parents. After this day, it is said that the orphans were truly orphaned because Amir al-Mu'mineen was known as the father of the orphans. As we see these qualities of Amir al-Mu'mineen, we will try over the next few nights to expand upon these. It is said in the books of history that during wars when Amir al-Mu'mineen was or had a thorn stuck in his foot, or he had an arrow in his foot. People, people would only remove that thorn or that arrow when Amir al-Mu'mineen would go into prayer. Because prayer to him was such, a, was such a, an elevated thing that when he was in prayer, he was only concentrating on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would forget about anything else any pain in his body and it is at this time that people would pull these thorns out of his feet whilst he's in the process of prayer. Because of this and with the nights of Al-Qadr coming up, over the next few episodes we'll be talking about prayer. We'll be concentrating and focusing on practical tips, on steps that you can take in your day-to-day -day lives in order to help you to concentrate on prayer to give you the best possible setup, best possible foundation so that you can make the most out of your a'mal and your prayers. And inshallah, we will be telling you practical steps which include things like spiritual elevation, how to prepare yourself before prayer, and also things to concentrate on when you're praying. Inshallah, until those episodes, I would like you to remember Amir al -Mu'mineen read the history books, read about his life, read about his biography. Unfortunately, even if I talked about Amir al-Mu'mineen throughout these 30 episodes, for the whole of these episodes, I would not be doing him justice. because There's so much to say about him. So I would just want each and every one of you, if you can't read the whole biography of Amir al-Mu'mineen, just read a few pages about what he was like as a person, how he led his life, how he treated those around him. Because don't forget, Amir al-Mu'mineen went through different stages of his life. Stages when he was the advisor to the Holy Prophet. A stage when he was outlawed and his rights were usurped. And a stage when he was actually the leader of the Muslim Ummah. 
throughout these stages of his life, he behaved in a very, very unique and a special way to everyone around him. And that's why his life can be related to so many of ours, because he went through so many different phases in his life. So please read the biography of Amir al-Mu'mineen, learn the teachings that he left behind, and please try and implement them in your day-to-day -day lives. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, O people, surely the month of God has approached you, the month which in the eyes of Allah is the most virtuous of the months. Its days are the best of days and its nights are the best of nights, and its moments the best of moments. As we go through these nights of Ramadan, during these episodes, we've been trying to get an insight onto what people from around the world do during this month, how they alter their day-to-day -day lives in order to make accommodations for the month of Ramadan, and how they adopt their day-to-day -day lives so that they can make the most and have spiritual elevation as much as they can during this holy month. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the metropolitan city of Paris, which is found as the capital city of France. Obviously, Paris has a very diverse community which exists of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And even within the Muslim community, we find that people come from, very, uh, from many, many diverse places around the world. However, in Paris, there is a predominant population of North Africans. And a lot of uh, the Muslim North African population, they have a very specific way in which they prepare for the month. Obviously, because Paris and France as a whole is a non-Muslim country, the working hours don't change, so people have to make do and they have to work during the month. However, a lot of people are f uh, find that when they collate their and bring together all of their leave from work, they try to take it all in the month of Ramadan, as much of it as they can during this holy month, so that they can rest and be ready for this month. A lot of people, especially from the North African communities, they like to eat food at home during the times of iftar. They get together with their families and close friends in their local communities and they have iftar at home. After which you will find from the very early days in the month of Ramadan that the Parisians, even the Muslims, the North Africans, in fact from all over, from all, over, from all races in Paris, will head to the city center in order to start preparing for the day of Eid. They don't want to leave it to the last few days, so they start very early during the month of Ramadan. When you go to Paris during the month of Ramadan, especially at night time, you will see that the city comes to life during the night. Due to the high Muslim population and especially the North Africans, you will see places like the Champs-Elysees or the Eiffel Tower will be flooded with people during the hours of the night, especially one or two hours after iftar time. As they head to town and they start to live their the day-to-day -day lives beginning at night. After this, they have their suhoor and they begin preparations for their next day. And in, in the month of Ramadan, obviously, because France is found in, in Europe, this year especially, it's going to be very long hours of fasting during the daylight time. So what they do is they usually try and have a break after work, have some rest, and then after that, prepare for the time of iftar. We've talked about Paris and inshallah we hope that we can explore and expand, talk about more places from all over the world and for that we really need your help. We hope that you can send in your videos, your pictures, even some anecdotes from how you or for how you prepare for this holy month, how you go about your day to day lives, how you prepare your food, how you deal with work, how you prepare your families for the nights of the A'mal. Inshallah, we hope to be getting your videos and your pictures soon so we can put them onto our channel so the rest of the world can also see 
how you prepare your day-to-day -day lives for the month of Ramadan. سيدنا ممكن تتفضلنا عن عملكم واللي تقدموه هنا بمعرض كربلاء؟ في الواقع في هذا المعرض معرض هدية كربلاء احنا عندنا عدة عدة اقسام اللي هي اللوحات الاسلامية عندنا هذا القسم الثقافي عندنا قسم الرايات والبيارق الحسينية والاسلامية عندنا قسم المأكولات اللي بحيث الزائر يقدر ياخذ يعني احنا حاولنا في هذا المشروع نغطي كافة على قولتكم انتم السوفينيرز شنو يقدرون ياخذون وياهم بحيث كصوغه كهديه وياهم الى دولتهم او محافظتهم ياخذوها من هنا امناها يعني قسم الملابس العطور كافة الشغلات اللي واحد يقدر ياخذها وياه Uh, I asked Sayyid Riyad about what they, they offer here and he's saying that this shop is consists of different uh, sections and different parts. Uh, they have uh, parts specified for children, uh, the, the part that we are here now exactly. Uh, they have other parts, they have like foods, they have uh, mohr and tasbih and they have also clothing uh, as well as Islamic tables uh, and paintings. So they, they, uh, their idea is to build a project where uh, a visitor from Iraq or outside of Iraq comes to this uh, shop and he can buy all the souvenirs that he needs to take back with him home. Okay, Sayyidina, can you tell us about this part that we are here? In the fact, this part is the part that we are focusing on, which is a number of things that are related to a number of things. For example, we have the local books, we have the books, we have the books, we have the books, we have the books, عندنا كتب الزيارات والقرائن المختلفه عندنا شالات وامور ثانيه هذا القسم الثقافي اللي حاولنا نركز به اكثر شيء على الاطفال في هذا القسم Uh, I asked Brother Riyadh about the section that we are here in uh, Karbala Souvenir. He's, uh, he's saying that uh, this part is the cultural part of uh, this shop. Uh, in this uh, part of the shop, they have uh, souvenirs regarding children, like uh, stories and uh, books for children. Uh, and they have also, they have some uh, stamps and other stuff, as well as different cultural books in this uh, section that they provided with the visitors of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Uh, نعم سيدنا الـ الـ البضاعة اللي موجودة هنا يمكم uh, كلها من صنع كربلاء لو أكو خارج كربلاء لو شنو يعني في الواقع أكو uh, uh, كثير من البضاعة اللي موجودة في هذا المعرض هي تابعة إلى شركة هدية كربلاء مثل السجادات اللي إن شاء الله تشوفوها uh, سجاداتنا والترب وال uh, السبح اللي موجودة عندنا عندنا هاي الشالات عندنا بعض الامور مثلا شنطه اللي تابعه للسجاده وبعض اللوحات الاسلاميه ايضا وبعض الامور اللي تابعه للاطفال والامور الثقافيه هذني تابعه الى شركتنا والبقيه ممكن تكون من بقيه من دول اخرى مثلا اللي هم نلقي نلقي الضوء عليها ان شاء الله في هذا التقرير Uh, I asked Brother Riyadh about uh, the products and he's saying that uh, most of the products that you can see here uh, are produced by themselves, by uh, Karbala Souvenir Shop, uh, like the prayer mats, uh, the tasbih, the more, and some, some of the tables and the paintings are uh, made here in the holy city of Karbala and by this project itself.
In this episode, as we look at medical and health related tips, I just want to go off on a tangent for these next few nights as we remember the sad nights of the month of Ramadan and we come across the nights of Al Qadr. We think about different facets of what we've learnt through our teachings. One of the studies that I found, one of the pieces of literature that was written by my brother Abbas was the memory of water. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about it, the importance of water in our lives and how we can influence the, the way that water affects us. In the Holy Quran, it is written, and amongst his signs is that he sends down water from the sky and therewith revives the earth after its death. Verily, in that are indeed signs for a people who understand. You see, water is a, is a natural substance. Without it, life cannot exist. We know that 70% of the planet is covered by water and approximately 70% of us is indeed made of water. A theory that was initially published by a French, a French scientist called Jacques Beneviste in 1988 said that water is capable of having a memory. A theory that was first met with skepticism from many other scientists. However, there were experiments that were done which confirmed this as well. Recently, a Japanese scientist called Dr. Emoto performed an experiment where he took normal tap water. He said some words, he put the tap water in different test tubes and in the different test tubes he blew or he said words over the water and after that he looked at the structure of the water on a molecular level and what he found astonished him. He said that the water remembered the word and as a result changed its structure. Studies have shown that a positive structure, a good structure of water can have positive effects on the body itself and a negative structure of water can have a negative effect on the human body. As we're aware that majority of our body is made of water, so if you have a good structure of water, it can help you with your health, but a negative structure of water will be detrimental to your health. This idea is extremely relevant because as a child, many of us have been taught to say Bismillah before drinking some water or before eating anything. The interesting thing is, Dr. Emoto, this Japanese scientist, found that the word that transformed the water into the most positive structure was the word of God. And verily by saying words like Bismillah, where you start off in the name of God, can only have a positive impact on the crystalline structure of that water. After all, a good structure of water can only help us and help the cells within our body and a bad structure of water will only be detrimental to our bodies. As I was growing up, I often used to see my mom and my dad recite verses of the Quran and then blow it onto water or used to recite dua and blow it onto water and we are taught from the, uh, the, the, the Ahlul Bayt salam, that there's certain uh, amal we can do, certain du'as we can recite, we can blow it on water, drink the water, or we can put certain things in the water and then drink that water. Often, many of the scientists in our community, many of the open thinkers, or so they, so they call themselves, they meet this with quite a lot of skepticism. And they say, how can this actually have a positive impact, what does it all mean? It is only when we look at studies like this do we actually find that saying things to water and reciting things to the water can actually have a positive impact on that water and when you drink it, it can only have a positive impact on yourself. For those of you who haven't read this literature, inshallah it will be published on social media, on, this, uh, on the Facebook page of the television channel Imam Hussein TV and inshallah you can read it for yourself, you can look at the pictures for yourself and see exactly how the crystalline structure of the water changes based on what is being said to it. This is an interesting 
theory which has been tested by this scientist. In fact, recently discussions have been held regarding digital biology. This is where waves are fired at a drug from a transmitter and the scattering pattern of the waves is then collected in a receiver. The waves that are collected in the receiver are then, then fired at a glass of water and then the patient is asked to drink it. A study conducted by um, Thomas found that treating human cancers in mice with water that had been transformed in this way using the audio signal, it's actually uh, a, a trade name that they've used which I'm not going to mention uh, due to um, uh, specific reasons. But this study showed that actually treating the cancer with this type of water actually helped to improve or to, to, to um, shrink the cancer down. So it does work and studies have been shown to see, uh, studies have been conducted to show that it does work. So at this juncture I just want you to take your mind back to the day of Ashura in Karbala. We look at the narrations and we see that Abul Fadl when he picks up the water in his hands he looks at the water and he spills it back into the river and then you think to yourself what effect must this have had on the water that effect was so profound that until this day the water is still encircling his grave and then when you see the study that was conducted by Dr. Emoto he said that the word peace above all gave the most perfect shape of the water, the, the, the crystalline structure of the water. So when we hear the stories, I've heard it in many poetries, I don't know whether this is actually verified through the narrations, but I've heard it in many pieces of poetry that Imam al Hussein has called out to his Shia and he said that when you drink a glass of water, send your peace and blessings upon me. So when you combine the study and what Imam al Hussein has said, we find that Imam al Hussein has asked us to send salam upon him, but that word salam itself will change the structure of the water and be only good for us. So if you think about that, you realize how much the, how much the Ahl Bayt actually want good for us and how much they love us. Even when we're remembering them, we're helping ourselves. In the Holy Quran, as I've mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent blessings our way in the form of water. Sometimes we can't see the immediate results of our prayers. But the, the, the sayings and the practices of the Ahlul Bayt the, 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 the teachings that they've given to us, we shouldn't treat with such skepticism. We should actually realize that there is a deeper meaning to them. And sometimes science does not tell us everything until further research is done. But because the Ahlul Bayt are the perfect beings, whatever they have suggested and taught us, we should try and follow their path because whatever we do is not only following their path, but is also good for us. I want to leave with this final thought, this final saying from Amir al-Mu'mineen, where he says, the cure is within you, but you do not see it. The illness is from you, but you do not realize. Do you think that you are but an insignificant mass whilst within you lies a great universe? And inshallah, if we apply the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt to our daily lives, it is not only good for us physically, but it allows us to ascend in a spiritual way as well. When the idol worshippers of Mecca found out that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was preaching against their idol worship, they became very angry and planned to murder him. Allah the Almighty and the All-Knowing informed Prophet Muhammad about the idol worshippers plan and told him to migrate with the Muslims from Mecca to Medina. This holy migration was called Hijrah. The night that Prophet Muhammad left for Medina, 40 men from 40 different tribes had gathered around his house to kill him. The Prophet asked Imam Ali 
if he could sleep in his bed that night so that so the idol worshippers would think that, Mama, that the Prophet was still in the house. Imam Ali smiled and was very happy and eager to do this favor for Prophet Muhammad because he knew that the, the life of Prophet Muhammad would be saved by his action. As a matter of fact, Imam Ali used to say that the best sleep he had was on that night. Allah said to the angel Jibra'il and Mikail that, the one, that one of them had to live longer than the other. He asked the angels whether either one of them would like to live longer. They both replied by saying that each one of them would like to live longer so they can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Allah then informed them, on earth tonight, one brother is willing to give up his life for the safety of his, of his other brother. Go down and protect him. Both angels, Jibra'il and Mikail, came down to the house of the Prophet and looked after Imam Ali all night long. After dawn time, after dawn time the killers rushed in, into, the, into the Prophet's house and pulled off the blanket from Imam Ali, peace be upon him. And they were shocked and angered to see Imam Ali instead of the Prophet and left with anger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked this action from Imam Ali and for this reason he, he revealed a verse on this occasion. Allah subhanahu, wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Baqarah in verse 207, He states, And among men is he who sells his soul for the sake of the pleasure of Allah the Almighty, and Allah loves such servants. The moral of this story and, and of the action of Imam Ali, peace be upon him, is that when we do something purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the sake of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us not only in this world but in the hereafter and not only a small amount but a huge amount of reflection. During this episode, as you remember the night when Amir al-Mu'mineen was struck by the sword, I want to dedicate this recitation, this poem, to Amir al-Mu'mineen. This poem was written by myself and my brother Abbas, where we highlight the traits of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the qualities that he left behind. At the end of the poem, there will be a short couple of verses which we have actually got from Professor Sipta Ja'far, who was a a poet from Pakistan and it's in Urdu. Professor Sipta Ja'far was, is one of the greatest poets of our generation. He was murdered very recently and he met his martyrdom because the haters of the Ahlul Bayt killed him just for being Shia. He was a professor in a very big school and because of his influence as well as his love for the Ahlul Bayt, he was killed. In his poem he says, that the water that you splash or the water that you put upon me after I die, do not call it a ghusl. And the piece of cloth that you enshroud me into after I die, do not call that a kafan. Because I'm on a journey to meet Ali ibn Abi Talib. This has been my dream since I was born. And as I die, I'm meeting my destiny. You couldn't hear and no orphans cry, no see a tear in their eyes. You'd give them food whilst in disguise, for this is how you spent your nights. Nabaun fil Qurani, yarifuk al qasi wa dani, walil yatam mutalib. Ali ibn Abi Talib Asadullah al-Ghalib Ghalib kulli ghalib Ya mudhir al-ajayib Ali ibn Abi Talib A lion in the battlefield Protected the Prophet like a shield if enemy stood up for the kill, it is as though their fate was sealed. Sana'a al-Sayf al-Bari, 
الفارق ضربتهم من ناري بذ الفقار الضارب علي بن أبي طالب أسد الله الغالب غالب كل غالب يا مظهر العجائب علي بن أبي طالب جب خدا کو پکارا علی آگئے جب علی آگئے زندگی آگئے غسل میت نہ کہنا میرے غسل کو اجل ملبوس کو مت کفن نام دو غسل میت نہ کہنا میرے غسل کو اجل ملبوس کو مت کفن نام دو میں چلا ہوں علی سے ملاقات کو جس کی تھی آرزو جس کی تھی آرزو جس کی تھی آرزو وہ گری آگئی The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, O people, surely the month of God has approached you, the month which in the eyes of Allah is the most virtuous of the months. Its days are the best of days and its nights are the best of nights, and its moments the best of moments. As we end this episode of the Ramadan show, I want to leave you with a final thought as we're approaching the nights of Qadr, the nights of contemplation, the nights of Ibadah. Thinking about philosophical things is very important and to give you a new direction of life. The thought I want to leave you with is something that my mother once told me when I was very, very young. When I'd done something that I thought she would be pleased of, I asked her, I said, are you proud of me? She said to me, son, don't do things to make us proud of you. Do things because in your heart, you know it's the right thing to do. We should use this in our lives because this saying has stayed with me for all of my life. Because essentially, we're not answerable to any mortal or any person in this world, even if they're our own parents. The only person we're answerable to is ourselves and our Lord. Because at the end of the day, it's Him to whom we're returning. I would like to once again thank you for watching the show. Inshallah, we hope that we've been able to impart some pearls of wisdom and give you some tools that can get, give you the best out of this month, Inshallah. I would like to once again ask you to please send in your videos. Please join us on social media as well using Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Finally, I would like to ask you to please, please not forget us in your du'as on these very special nights. Please remember myself, please remember my team, and inshallah, most importantly, please don't forget to pray for the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. With that, I bid you farewell with the following words. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.